things at once. Okay, so hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to Cash Kihi's session, Lifetime of Type Development, What Leader Biographies Reveal. Over to you, Cash. Hey, thanks so much, Sarah, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I realize the title that I'm showing here is a little different than the one that was advertised. I only had so many characters that I could put my title into, but really, uh, what I'm going to be telling you, you is not all leaders develop <laughs> fully, and I'm sure that's no surprise to you, but it could be a lifetime or not of type development. So uh, to kind of gear up for uh, this presentation, I went on my uh, kind of morning walk. It's 9.30 a.m. where I am in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, can you tell my type from uh, uh, these pictures here? Uh, uh, yeah, kind of... Uh, uh, this is just this morning, what I witnessed, and I loved the, the, the snail on the flowers and just uh, getting grounded in just the beauty of the surroundings and doing my walking meditation. So any guesses on my type here? Uh, yeah, uh, extroverted sensing <laughs> with feeling. So accent on that subjective aesthetic uh, quality, as I learned yesterday from Dario, that holistic uh, uh, SE uh, function. So a little bit about me uh, and uh, since I'm new to presenting to, uh, to BAPT, uh, I spent about 20 something years inside large Fortune 500 companies uh, doing a variety of functions in different kinds of industries. And of course that variety really suits me as uh, in my type. Uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, and by the way, if you don't like quotes, you might want to leave now because this presentation is going to have lots of quotes. And the one that I would start with here is, I love when I find quotes like this, um, <laughs> that Jung kind of has these amazing insights. And, and really, you know, Jung was very much about how um, the individual needs to separate from the collective. And, uh, and that is a huge challenge when you work in these large organizations. So to continue the resume, uh, about 20 something years of training and coaching. Now those years overlapped, I'm not quite that old, but uh, my work has been primarily focused on leadership development uh, and diversity and conscious bias. I was privileged before the pandemic to teach, uh, facilitate workshops in 21 countries on six continents, uh, thousands of frontline leaders. Both of my two clients have now converted entirely uh, to virtual. So you'll see kind of I want you to know where I'm coming from, and it's working with frontline leaders. I'm not working a lot with CEOs or uh, that sort. I'm getting people while well, before they've developed those bad habits, you know, early uh, in their career. And so a bit about my, you know, qualified in the MBTI 1999, uh, some certifications. I'm going to use a little bit of my uh, book here, uh, but just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from um, as uh, uh, this person. So see if you can pick up some uh, type preferences in the following quotes uh, that I think relative to our topic today, uh, you know, uh, speak to me. <laughs> and, and we'll talk about, you know, when you have this theory, why is it the devil? Um, I think largely because we see the world as we are, not as it is. And so everyone has a different kind of theory. Uh, how about this one? <laughs> Doesn't this reflect kind of a sensing <laughs> preference? You know, they're all wrong. Some are useful. I'll take the ones that are, are useful. And uh, I love this one. If the territory and the map disagree, believe the territory. It's not about the model. It's about what is real. And that comes from the Swedish army manual. So uh, uh, my agenda here, we've got a lot to cover. Um, we're going to look and explore the, you know, what is leadership, and then I want to give you, did you know that Jung actually defined leadership? I'm going to give you that definition, and so stay tuned, and then we're going to talk about some things he said about development, and then I'm going to share with you a model of type development that has resonated with me ever since I was first exposed to it about 11 years ago, and then in uh, researching the U.S. president's and their type development using that kind of model uh, to understand how they developed over their lifetime. 
And I've even begun to make some inferences about midlife transition. Um, and we speak of leaders needing to be twice born. And then I'm gonna give you some suggestions towards the end around how to develop your leadership capacity. Sound good? I mean, everyone on board, uh, you're here. I appreciate it because if I weren't here, I'd wanna be in David Poole's session. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to listen to his recording. But let me tell you, we're gonna move quickly. Um, so I'm, I apologize in advance if you're not able to, you know, uh, read every slide at the end. I will say and give you my uh, uh, email address. So in case you want a PDF of the slides, I'm gonna make those uh, available to you. So first poll, and I believe, uh, have you got the poll ready there, um, Sarah, uh, to run the poll, the first poll here? I'd like to get to know basically the audience. Um, yeah, here we go. Everyone, please, if you would indicate uh, dominant. And I'm curious in the chat if people want to say, do you prefer to use function attitude? Do you use, I'm going to use probably cognitive mode. Um, and uh, I, I think how many have we got? 25 out of 26, that's close enough. Let's end the poll. Uh, share the results. Uh, I, I no, Why do I feel lonely in this room? <laughs> is, it, is it me or what? But uh, I find it interesting and, uh, and I'm interested to see all of these different. So I, I was wondering who should I speak to most, but I should speak to all of you, of course. And, and so let's, uh, how do I stop sharing results and move on? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Good to know where you're coming from, and I hope I share some things with you that will be helpful to you. So let's talk about why study leaders. And, and here, if you want to be in the chat and you know start a conversation, uh, I would appreciate that. Here's what I get out of Jung's uh, material. Um, the, he talks about leaders having potency um, and that people recognize this. Uh, he says, even primitive man knows who has more status, who has more power, and, and kind of looking at that potency. He also does a whole essay on mana personality where this god-likeness uh, takes over and, uh, and the hero archetype. And I'm gonna talk about this, um, you know, the hero being the dominant function of your personality. In leaders, what we find is their will, their ambition really spurs that hero archetype. And, and so that's why I'm kind of looking at them as examples of how they've uh, developed over time. Why political leaders? Um, as opposed to organizational leaders, I gave you a clue as to why I don't think, um, I, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, just because you're a manager doesn't make you a leader. Uh, and, and so, political leaders, I believe people voted for them. Uh, they had followers. And uh, I love the Mark Twain quote, he who leads when no one follows is just taking a walk. <laughs> and uh, Peter Drucker, the guy who invented management um, said, leaders are defined by the fact they have followers. And of course, now we know on social media, there are influencers who are leaders, who people follow. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's worthy to, to study them. Of course, there's that relationship to followers, which is very key uh, to understanding, a symbiosis um, that can be problematic, uh, as we'll talk about. Um, and why these US presidents? Um, first of all, thousands of books, biographies, articles. Um, and finally, that I've got assessment data on these presidents that I'm going to talk about. So that enabled me to do uh, a deep dive into them. Um, by the way, I just wanna say up front, these are not you know, how I necessarily would have typed them or not that I'm really even that good at typing people. This is solidly based on, you know, like Jung used to say, I'm an empiricist. I wanna look at the data. I wanna see what is it saying here. So uh, with that, I wanna ask you in the chat, uh, you know, what makes someone a leader? Uh, a leader you would willingly follow. This is actually a, an exercise that I do in my classes where I get people to write down four or five traits, um, qualities of a leader, kind of what is it that causes you to want to follow? And the, and the key word here was willingly. 
uh, not because you have to, not because you report to them, um, but, um, and, and feel free, Sarah, to jump in and shout out kind of what's happening in the chat as I'm not able to, to see it, but, um, uh, you know, we've got that. Um, others, uh, trust, uh, being inspiring, being competent. Yep, yep, all great things and different things, wouldn't you agree? And yes. um, let's uh, put up the second poll, would you? I'm gonna ask you, what qualities do you associate with a natural leader? Um, and so uh, that poll, please, uh, Sarah, or do you start it or do I? Poll number two. Sarah, you're, Sarah muted. you're muted. You ought to be able to do that. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, so I'm seeing, let me go to poll two here. It should be me, huh? That's doing it. Okay. okay. I, I can, there you go. Yeah. And it's multiple choice here. So um, go ahead and you're, you're seeing. I just the, lost it. It just. Okay. okay. Let me. Um, oh, okay. okay. Hold on. Relau I'm going to relaunch polling here. Here we go. Okay. There we go. All right. Mm, interesting. It's neck and neck between visionary and inclusive. Uh, we're keeping, I've got 25 of 26 now that have responded. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and uh, share the results. Wow. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, and I wondered if this would happen, uh, the dominant uh, 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 cognitive mode in the room was introverted feeling. And guess what? my inclusive leader type is. It's the one for introverted feeling. Uh, so in some cases, we're looking at leaders for what, like us, uh, we relate to them, we connect with them, uh, they value what we value, things like that. Or, you know, we think of in, notice how visionary is more the introverted intuition. Um, and so uh, I, I, I find this fascinating. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll get more of the take charge leader, the authoritarian leader, but notice how all uh, of these qualities are represented uh, here. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at um, the, uh, the point being that leadership is subjective. And, and the reason I say that is when I do that exercise with students and they come up with four or five qualities of a leader. And I asked someone in the class to nominate a particular quality, uh, and they do. Um, and then I have, now I want everyone, not that because they just said that you agree with them, but did you write that down? Was that one of the qualities that, and guess what I have found? That not one quality will get more than 50% of the votes in a class. And, and that tells me that this leadership thing is incredibly subjective. Uh, we know one when we see one, uh, we know one, um, but it's, uh, it's a little different. So in thinking about what is leadership then, uh, what do leaders do? And again, I'd love your answers in the chat because afterwards, uh, while I can't see it right now, I wanna go back and look at it. And uh, uh, you know, part of my work in leadership and leadership development over the last 20 years has been researching various definitions of leadership. Um, what is it? And it's, you know, it's kind of a hard concept to, to get your head around. But here's one thing that I have definitely found. I have seen in leadership definitions, uh, definite type preferences, uh, people reflecting uh, their own kind of uh, view of themselves and what's needed by a leader in their, through their lens. And, and so part of my work has been trying to find a, a definition that is kind of overarching and kind of elements of leadership that every leader must do. But now for the drum roll, what do you think, and I'm gonna ask you this before I show you uh, Jung's definition, see if you can pick up some type preferences in how Jung uh, defined leadership. 
hoping you can all see this. Hmm. What does it sound like to you? Hmm. Discovers a new way. Hmm. Uh, intuition, anyone? <laughs> uh, um, and to greater certainty. I, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm picking up some intuition and thinking, which not surprisingly were what? <laughs> uh, Jung's preferences. Uh, and, and so he goes on a little bit further to say this, um, that everyone wants to understand. Now, in my work in leadership, we found people want other things uh, besides understanding. They want belonging, uh, they want relatedness, uh, they want fairness, uh, they want autonomy, uh, they want some certainty. There's other things that people want. But I find it interesting that Jung goes with a, um, a very much a, a kind of a thinking basis to, to what leaders do and what they provide. Uh, to uh, their followers. So now kind of, you know, if that's what, and I'm going to bring up other things that Jung said and thought about leaders, but let's just recap a few insights that are going to be germane to my presentation here. Um, and, and this is the aspect, the first one is the aspect of will. Uh, Jung was very big on volition, um, that this is something you and before I can choose, I have to what? I have to know, I have to perceive. Um, and notice the, and by the way, the bolds are my emphasis here, um, that it is with moral deliberation, uh, that that is a key piece of kind of how he sees um, people uh, developing and coming to terms with. Of course, he defined his life as coming to terms with that entity we call God. Um, and, and so there's a big emphasis here on his part by that. The next one is um, we, we tend to think of our you know, type as our personality. And really that's only ego development. Uh, that's a, a, a consciousness. And so this slow stages throughout life um, and that personality isn't personality until it's whole. And then he gets into a debate about is that even possible? And, and he says, we must still strive for the ideal of a fully developed person, even if that's not entirely realistic for, for most people. And he said, he went further on defining wholeness, that it is not achieved by cutting off. And what, what he means by that is the first half of life being taking the unconscious out and, and, and parsing through what is me and, and ignoring and repressing what is not me. But he said the wholeness comes in the second half of life where you are integrating all of those things that the first half of life you said you were not, now they are coming into, you know, they are demanding attention. Attention must be paid. And he's gonna talk about how the unconscious elements and contents need to be uh, brought to the fore. Because he said, knowledge of the unconscious is indispensable. And, and what we're finding in leadership development is that leaders must pay more attention to what's going on in their unconscious. And, and this is something that I'm really big on um, in my workshops is a self-awareness, um, because I believe before you can lead others, you've got to first lead yourself. And before you can lead yourself, you must know yourself. And, and so that is just a fundamental premise. But knowing oneself isn't going to come from just knowing my, you know, my type code, my letters, my, it, it's much more than that. And here, I'm sure many of you recall this, if you're not, you know, haven't seen it lately, is that the program in the afternoon is not the same program as the program in the morning. And that at about age 35 to 40, uh, people reach their zenith. And what they don't realize is that they've already passed it and it begins to act on them. Um, and so uh, I love, he, he says this over and over in different ways, but small and hidden 
is the door that leads inward. Um, and the interest is barred <laughs> by countless uh, predictions, mistaken assumptions, and fears um, that basically we don't want to confront our unconscious, uh, that it's this big boogie bear and, uh, and, and we would just rather not deal with that. And what Jung sees in the second half of life is kind of a split. Um, some people becoming very rigid in their ego and their development, what we would call their, you know, their first couple of functions and attitudes that are developed, um, but then they don't grow any further. They don't go through that twice born uh, aspect. And here was something that he comes to as well, that find out what a person fears most. And that is where he will develop next. And I'm gonna kind of end with that in terms of some recommendations for how you can move into uh, the challenges that you need to. So I wanna, and, and part of dealing with the unconscious is um, images that suggest things. And uh, those of you who've been on a, the young discovery group, the Myers Spato group with me will re maybe not recognize this, but I came across the black and white image in archetypes of the collective and the and archetypes and the collective unconscious and the secret of the golden flower. And I researched how could I get a copy of this? And would you believe this past week, I emailed and secured the rights to use this. And the reason is, for some reason, um, spirals appeal to me uh, and, and cyclical uh, things that are in motion. And I, and I think this image, by the way, was done by an elderly female patient of Young's. Does anyone notice the date at the bottom? November the 20th, 1928 um, was when it was uh, drawn uh, by one of his patients. And of course he used these mandalas and this is a circular mandala, not all mandalas are square, uh, to kind of, um, uh, you know, to get people focused on what is their vision of wholeness. That is the key, not what is the vision of myself, but what is my vision of my wholeness uh, that was there from the very beginning. Uh, so uh, Jung says the process of development proves on closer inspection to be cyclic or a spiral. And then this, what is the process about, <clears throat> is um, it's the realization of what has been there all along. Um, that is uh, this embryonic germ plasma. So do you see why this image to me connects so much to kind of what Jung is talking about in terms of how we evolve, how we, um, and he, he says, it's not that we create ourselves, but rather we happen to ourself. And that we, uh, we're in this process, but we don't realize it. Um, but there is this germ within us of this wholeness. And, and that is part of the journey is to, uh, to, to reach that. So uh, let me get back to, to leaders here. Uh, I, I find it fascinating that, um, <clears throat> and before I go on and before I forget, if you want an incredible essay um, by Jung on, um, uh, written in 1946 called After the Catastrophe, um, it's an incredible analysis of Hitler and the, psych the psychology of Germany at the time and how that uh, uh, manifested itself. Um, the Princeton University Press made it available. Uh, if you don't have a copy, email me and I'll be happy to, to send you the free copy that I got. Um, but you will, I, I, and I, I don't wanna go into politics and things like this here, um, but you could substitute almost exactly um, uh, Donald Trump for, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it, the, the description of him as a leader with, uh, you know, the country and what is happening. And, and so it's a very powerful essay, at least I found it to be uh, from looking at that. And again, I apologize for the politics, but it's a, it's a very powerful uh, article. Um, and, and the reason I'm using these two images is because Jung actually talks about Napoleon versus Lao Tzu. 
Uh, any guesses as to where um, Jung comes down on, <laughs> which side uh, he, he favors? Um, yeah, he, he believes that it is this will to power um, that tempts leaders and, and then they are caught up in the mass movement uh, themselves. And, and so I find this is further amplification of just that the, the true leaders are always those who are capable of self-reflection um, and who, who really disassociate, separate themselves from the collective and understand the best gift I can give my followers is guess what? <laughs> to work on myself and, and to really be the best I can be uh, in, in, in leading others. So um, very um, um, powerful kinds of things here to, uh, to consider. So um, I uh, did research and read obviously over and over, uh, uh, you know, particularly chapter 10 in uh, psychological types, but the whole book studied. And what I did was try to take Jung's eight types and put them into leadership. Um, what does it look like when that dominant type is leading? Um, and we know, and so these things should be familiar to you if you're you know, working in the cognitive modes, function attitudes, uh, you understand that this, but in a leader, it's like their CEO when it's dominant. And um, it's usually the most developed the core of their leadership brand, but it will limit and determine their judgment. And, and so what I see in the decisions and of leaders is that this is incredibly um, impactful on their style and, and really on how they view problems and situations. So my eight types in leadership are uh, these. And I'll just go ahead. I don't need to read to you. I hope you uh, have a screen where you can uh, read this. Um, and, and again, of course, I, I had to choose words. And, and so I tried to, to choose words that related more to a, a, a business leadership, quite frankly, and words that they would recognize and kind of identify with. And so I see myself as a proactive, inclusive leader. Uh, you might be a, a prudent, take charge leader. So do you see what I mean? Your, your brand, and, and what I'm really big on with young leaders is helping them understand their brand, uh, which is their ego development. So they can be at least operating in their ego and not in their persona or their archetypes or things like that. So they can really focus on, on developing themselves. So. I'll, I'll give this, you know, more work here, but th the basic point here I want to make is that you are not just one, you have all eight. And when I wrote the book, Eight Leader Types in the White House, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, there was only one leader type <laughs> being displayed in the White House, uh, sometimes three or four, uh, sometimes only five or six, and rarely, if ever, all eight. And that's what I'm going to share with you is kind of the degree to which these uh, were present according to the data. Um, and so how did I get my data? Um, and so the primary source was in fact another book um, that I got a hold of uh, by two PhDs who went out and got 120 historians to complete the revised NEO personality inventory or the big five on 42 presidents. Um, of course, I'm given the date, uh, this does not, the data does not include Obama or Trump, um, but the, I, I wanna make the point here that th these are people that focused on the presidency or on certain eras. And in fact, for the eight in my book, there were 13 to 20 historians whose perspectives were averaged, their perception of, uh, those presidents and the generalists were the same. So the same seven generalists rated uh, these presidents plus, um, uh, you know, between six to 13 uh, specialists in, an, in that era. 
And, and so how did I kind of get at it? So my methodology was basically to analyze the 192 items in only four of the five factors. I didn't really go into neuroticism. Uh, perhaps in retrospect, there were some <laughs> things there that might relate to um, certain parts of type for some types. Um, but I, and, and I had the help of, I, I hope she doesn't mind my acknowledging, Danielle Poirier uh, in terms of, of really kind of looking at that item and saying, does that, what does that reflect? Uh, is it uh, SP or is it, uh, you know, SI or is that some, you know, like, uh, you know, a feeling or, and, and that's the, and I only used facets where more than half of the items reflected a type preference or mode. And, and just so to recap, and Richard did a great job kind of overviewing uh, the five factors and the abstraction up to you know, the high level, but at the low level, there are eight items per facet and six facets per each of the factors. So that's where the 192 uh, you know, kind of items come from. And what I found was to produce the preference scores, three to four facets. Um, and again, depending on if all of them reflected a certain type preference, then I was um, weighting that more uh, than the other. And in the case of the cognitive mode scores, four to five facets. So I'm using uh, basically a big spreadsheet, which has got the average scores for all of these uh, uh, items averaged together by those historians. And then I sorted, you know, in the preference, then it's a matter of sorting, where do you sort? And so looking at type statistics, others' hypotheses of those presidents um, and kind of pulling it together. So at some midpoint, I, I, I sort it and I was able to produce preferences, whole type uh, and their leader type scores with a range. And so now I've got percentiles. Uh, that I can use to kind of compare <clears throat> this sample, admittedly, a skewed sample of 42 uh, white males over the age of 35. <laughs> I hate to say it, but you know, my next book is going to be uh, female leaders on the global stage. <laughs> but right now, it's uh, you know, this is the data I have to work with, and and so I hope you'll forgive me. You know, it was terrible to come out with a book on those eight old white men, I'm sorry, but uh, at just the moment in time when everyone is becoming woke, it, it really didn't sell very well, you know, and so I think that was part of the, uh, the issue. But here was my finding, um, and I'm not going to give you the, you know, the rankings and everything, but um, before rankings even became very politicized in, in this uh, country, uh, if you go back and look at polls back in 1982, liberals and conservatives agreed on nine out of the quote top 10 presidents. And when we say top 10, let me just you know throw it out there. I'm not talking about their morality. I'm not talking about, they were consequential. And what I mean by they had an impact, uh, whether you like them or not like them or what their policies or their you know, character was, you can't avoid the fact that because of them, uh, the United States was different and uh, or the United States even existed and, and that the end that in some cases the world was different because of them. So it's um, I, and, and wh where did where did all this come from? You know, cash, you know, remember preferences for ESFP. Uh, you know, digging into all this research and writing the book, which took me forever. You know, it was spurred by a question from one of my students um, in India, actually, and I'll never forget the question. He asked the question because we were looking at in that curriculum, uh, personality type. He asked the question, what personality type makes the best leader? And I at first just like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I, I use the consultant answer of it depends, you know, and depends on the situation, it depends on what they bring. But my book was really a, a passion for, and, and I didn't try to make this happen, it just in the data, this, and, and so my point is, I don't care what your type is, you can be a quote, great leader. 
but you need to understand it's going to look very different from you know the visionary is going to be the opposite of the proactive the inclusive the opposite of the take charge these are different styles that have different manifestations and so i want to share some of the um, uh, you know the, the the things that i found i'm, I'm not going to stay on this slide um, but I just want you to see, you know, the names at the top and, and what you're seeing here are the percentile scores. Um, and, and so in some cases where you see 100%, they were the most um, reflective of that cognitive mode and that leader type. Uh, so Jackson, in the case of a proactive leader type, uh, Jefferson, in case of, uh, you know, visionary, uh, John Adams in terms of being very independent minded, a thought leader. Now, some of them, but for all of them, their dominant leader type um, was the highest percentile score. And I, I know this is probably not statistically correct, even using percentiles and things like this. But if you see at the bottom, I'm saying that that's almost a proxy for how much they developed. Because again, you're comparing their score with the sample. And if you're averaging how they scored relative on all of those, then the average would be, do we see more type development in some of them than, than others? So uh, just a point about that. So let me now shift to um, the model that I found at work in these leaders, um, which is Angelo Spoto. And uh, Angelo has been working on this model for 25, 30 years as a psychotherapist. And he has found it just incredibly helpful in his own practice, you know, as Jung's compass. Um, but what he believes, and I'm going to show it to you graphically, is that development is moved along by the tension of opposites. And it is the union of opposites, which technically that is the transcendent function, which produces a third not given and moves the process along psychologically, such that the first half of life, he believes, gives you two functions in two attitudes, your basic ego pattern. Now, think about in your work with clients, uh, if you do, uh, I find the function pair exercises to usually be one of the most reliable in terms of getting people to uh, you know, kind of have this similar perspective. Um, so anyway, and particularly for certain kinds of uh, investigations. But what he finds is that at midlife, there's this confrontation of who I am based on this ego pattern I've developed in the first half of life versus who I could be, uh, that there's more to my story, um, that I have more to become, uh, that I'm not just who I thought I was. Um, and that, um, what he says is, those are four, and I would put in quotes here, inferior functions. Yes, we've got the, the big inferior function, but uh, Angelo sees these kind of opposites of our ego pattern as, how, as inferior functions that need to be integrated. And uh, if you're familiar with the work of uh, Mira, Mina Baranami, um, uh, Mark Majors, Ray Moody, uh, their data supports this order. Uh, it's very similar. You'll know uh, Mina refers to the tr tricycle pattern. Um, and, and so uh, I gave this as a handout, so I'm not going to, to linger on it. I, I just want you to be able to know that uh, your type uh, extroverts move from the bottom up. Uh, introverts from the top down, uh, you'll, you'll see this. And, and again, you've got a, a handout of it. Let me share with you kind of graphically uh, what it's about. But first, let's, you know, just more to confirm your knowledge and understanding about uh, what are the uh, cognitive mode, I call them ideals. Uh, what are they striving for? And, and so introverted sensing, striving for stability, security, where do they get that? They get that from their traditions and some sense of predictability based on this is the way things have been, this is the way they will go. 
Um, and so that is their uh, basic kind of uh, need and drive uh, for that. Extroverted sensing, uh, simplicity, agility, uh, which means what? They get that out of adventure, out of crises and responding in the moment and doing that sort of thing. And, and you go down the list. And so I wanna credit Danielle Poirier. I also wanna give a caveat that I, you know, varied or differed a little bit on some of my understandings and her words, but I, I do wanna credit that she really had a, a strong part in this. So can you see how, when we think about these things, um, how many of you recall the stages of life where, you know, it's play, then learning, then, you know, work, and then whatever, uh, you know, we go through these phases, uh, stages of life, uh, where these are the key drivers for us. And what we're forgetting is kind of what's in the unconscious as we do that. So let me share with you uh, Angelo's model, and I'm going to use INTJ. I'm wondering if we have I, INTJ in the room, and it's going to become apparent why I'm using my the opposite of who I am. Let me just say, if I were using my own, this presentation would go on for an hour and a half, because from the time Angelo presented this model 10 years ago, I immediately resonated with it in terms of my life's development, the trajectory, if you will, of the first half of my life, the, the crisis I had at midlife, what I went through, what I dealt with, and came out on the other side with. And so incredibly powerful, and uh, I just hope he gets published. Uh, Angelo doesn't like to do Zooms, uh, I, you know, and I wish he would, uh, but I am really encouraging him to publish this. And the reason being, um, and I've read some of his writings on it, is he analyzes Jung and believes Jung's type preferences were INTJ. And he makes a case for what happened at Jung's midlife. And so what he believes is, you know, our natural innate preferences come out in terms of um, our ego identifies in this case, first of all, with introverted intuition, but in the background, in the kind of the not me would be extroverted sensing. And here's the key is the transcendent function does not proceed without aim and purpose, but it leads to the revelation of the essential man. And think of not the transcendent function in a big way, but in kind of many uh, episodes or many transcendences uh, throughout your life. And do you see, again, the, the definition of the transcendent function is union of opposites. So once this, you know, there is this tension of opposites, but once there's a union of opposites, it projects you into the next uh, development phase. And, and here, the momentum, the process of change and type development, Angelo believes, is you keep one thing, you change another. So you don't change all the way from, um, <clears throat> extroverted perceiving function to introverted judging function. That the process is one of, and in this case, do you see what's kept? The added, keep the attitude, change the function. And then that kicks in to the next phase, which is keep the function, change the attitude. And then the last phase would be keep the attitude, change the function. Whatever has not been fully fleshed out. And, and then <laughs> there is the turn, uh, the midlife um, uh, crisis and event. And I won't go into detail because I'm not sure I fully understand it. But what Angelo sees in, um, in Jung, uh, in particular, the writing of the Red Book, uh, which after his breakup with Freud, um, he, he really went in Interior. He went within and that it was a confrontation of his unconscious introverted feeling and introverted sensing. And if you think about the Red Book, lots of images. Uh, by the way, at one point, someone encouraged Jung to be an artist. 
And he, re and he believed that introverted sensing types, because they take in images and make them real, are much more gifted or you know oriented to that. So he kind of was rejecting that as a career choice, but he wanted to honor that within him in terms of the images. Now, the other thing you can't get past in the Red Book is uh, Jung's dealing with some serious relationship <laughs> kinds of stuff. And, and the introverted feeling piece uh, in an immature, undeveloped way. And no wonder it's called the Red Book. Uh, and by the way, these colors are the Jungian colors. Uh, Jung said one time that bright colors attract the unconscious. And so he was a big fan of using uh, uh, bright colors. Um, so then what happens is we're integrating what's been subdued, what's been repressed, what's been not me, and we're now looking up from below. Uh, that when we make that turn, our now perspective on the ego is from this underworld of, um, uh, of these uh, uh, particular cognitive modes. So I, I you know, can't spend a whole lot of time on this, but let me share with you kind of one quote from Jung from actually the, the Red Book. And you always wonder in the Red Book, is Jung being autobiographical or is he being like just putting something out there? But um, I, I think he's saying, yeah, this, there's a process, but be careful that don't, the, the formula, your experience may vary. Uh, your results may vary. <laughs> so I don't want to be too prescriptive or, you know, um, but um, and Angelo has described this as more a descriptive model. Um, and I believe it's more of a chronological model of development. But one take that I have on it, and I've always wondered this, why does the midlife transition differ so much by, uh, and differ between people and I think, no surprise, it's this partly typological. And, and so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this, but see if this resonates with your own experience. If this is your type, what it would suggest is what you are confronting in your unconscious at the turn, at that, that midlife, whether it's 35, 40, 45, maybe beyond. Um, and, and so these are just some uh, words, obviously, that uh, you know, I've chosen that somehow reflect what's going on between those two function attitudes in your unconscious. Um, and, and again, uh, not to get too personal here, um, but mine was definitely one of tradition versus originality. Uh, mine was also one of um, authenticity and mastery. Um, so just the same functions, of course, different functions, but just the same order of the functions that Jung, but for me, that was my confrontation with the unconscious. And so you can see why I'm such a big believer in this, because it just, it resonates with me personally. Um, and so I, I give you that. Now, before I got start showing the presidents and their development, uh, let me remind you, if you're still kind of wondering which one am I, just as a, uh, so you can focus in on uh, kind of yours and, and take a look at it. So I use word clouds and um, I, I have a card sort to help leaders kind of get their brand and ego kind of solidified. Um, and what I find is, interestingly, based on their best fit type and their age. And I think this is something we should spend a whole lot more time on is the age at which people uh, take the indicator or try to assess themselves and, and do that. I find that the one that is emerging in their unconscious tends to pop up and appear in, in the, and when they do this card sort. So, um, uh, I, and, and here I came across this quote and I had to be in all total transparency. I, you know, I'm treading on thin ground here, I realize, in terms of trying to describe someone's individuation process from my case material, from the data. And I loved what uh, Mina Buranami said yesterday about how 
let's remember this is not reality. This is not these people. And I don't want to minimize the whole individuation process. This is my interpretation of the data about those people that was completed by historians. So I just want to make that caveat. So let's <clears throat> like, hmm, why did I choose ESTP? I don't know, but it's my, um, it just, to, you know, you can read through a couple of things here. He had a, a moment of self-awareness when he realized I'm not fit to be president, but of course this is before he ran for president. Um, and, and so what I see in his life pattern, and here I'm gonna show that you this for several uh, presidents, is first of all, this, this tension of opposites. And so Andrew Jackson uh, had to be a survivor. Um, he lost his two older brothers and his mother in the Revolutionary War. And forgive me, Sarah, he harbored a hatred of the British ever and for the rest of his life. No, you know, but he was an orphan at 14 and living on, in the wilderness and dealing with having to react in his environment. And, and that I believed kind of really that challenge early in life and that hero archetype plus his strong relationship to his mother, um, you, you know, really began to solidify that. Now, what comes next? He uh, studied law. Uh, he uh, established his 12 principles, which he published. Uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, he studied law and, and actually became uh, a lawyer. Uh, and uh, judge, and uh, and this was the process that that he I think went through. Now that's the process. What did I see in the data? The data looks more like this, and and so let me make sure you understand that the size of each shape of the leader type is scaled to the percentile score that they were relative to forty two presidents. So Andrew Jackson, number one, 100th percentile, proactive kind of leader time. And do you see how he has this tricycle pattern that um, uh, Mina and others have found in, in data in huge samples of uh, personality type data. But notice what else, and I found this so fascinating, and this happens for in my profile, of course, I'm ESFP preferences. But what Mina found in the data was a high correlation between SE and NE, between the proactive and the innovating leader. So let me give you another president that uh, more recent president that I believe had these uh, type preferences. And this is George uh, W. Bush. Uh, George II, uh, as, as we refer to him. And so the um, notice how, again, the proactive and the innovating are what? Now I saw Paula, you had a question. Did you want to? Yeah. You know? Can you explain the triangle, I'm sorry, tricycle pattern? Because I'm not, it's not obvious to me. Yeah. Okay. And, and thank you for asking that, um, Paula. So what Mina found is in her data in looking at this is, you know, we uh, always believed there was, if your dominant function was extroverted, then you introverted your opposite. Uh, you know, if it was perceiving that you introvert your judging, you see what I mean? But what she sees in the data and what I see in these scores is that there is a step to that auxiliary. And so she sees these um, and if you think about it, Carl Jung said, um, when he was describing types, he would say that's an extroverted sensor with thinking. So do you see not distinguishing between introverted thinking and extroverted thinking? I'm an extroverted sensor, which is supported by, in other words, the back two wheels of the tricycle. So he didn't oh, assign oh. an attitude to the auxiliary. Right. And, and, and now, and same sort of pattern for me. Um, I mean, and in fact, part of the deal is my preference clarity for feeling is much greater than my preference clarity for uh, sensing. And so that supporting those two as a supporting function um, is what's going on here. 
Um, now, you'll notice how uh, uh, George W. Bush's, and I realize we've got about five minutes, right, Sarah? I'm going to accelerate this pretty quickly. Uh, I realize now uh, too much, but you know that compassionate conservatism. You know his inclusive, his feeling uh, much stronger here. Here's if and by the way, George Bush uh, of all the presidents, 42 in the sample, this was the least tight development of of any of the the 42. Uh, by my way, the most Abraham Lincoln, and and so you'll see here. Uh, just by the size of the shapes, um, that his perspective taking was so huge in terms of his multifaceted personality, particularly when you think he was killed at, a, at an early age. Um, and so I'm going to kind of move through these pretty quickly. Um, I, I, sometimes I use these to try to convince people of his, you know, introverted feeling uh, you know, kind of nature. Uh, let me go to Harry Truman, ESFJ, um, common, decent, uh, but very much persuasive. And notice the accomplishments of Harry Truman here in terms of persuading people. He even wrote a book on leadership and he defined leadership as persuasion. So this was, you know, it's one of the reasons I chose that, that, that label. Here's his ESFJ, and notice that the take charge. So do you see how the second half of life is, if you started your dominant function as a judging function, you know, feeling extroverted, your second half of life is gonna be more that judging function extroverted, but the one you didn't uh, do. And, and so, in fact, the take charge leader type was what was coming into four when he was president. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, visionary, uh, lots of things that sound like uh, strategic, uh, you know, his, uh, and by the way, people think, well, he was, you know, an inventor and an architect, and I'm sorry, there are INFJs who are inventors and architects. And, and so, uh, and, and his motto was intimate with few, be intimate with few, but polite to all. Uh, and, and so that was, you know, and he said, I prefer the dreams of the future to the history of the past. So his mind was focused entirely on what he, his vision, um, and he had very well developed um, in, in terms of his uh, cognitive modes, uh, to compare it to a more recent INFJ, Jimmy Carter, uh, who I have a lot of personal respect for, uh, lots of type development going on there. Um, and so I, I, realizing I wouldn't have time to share all of the, the presidents, I hope that's giving you some sense of how their development varies uh, over their lifetimes, uh, what comes to the fore, the, the sequence of it. But one of the keys that I find to development is moving into challenges, um, moving into situations that require that particular leader type. And a great book, which is not a type book, but just a book that I've read a couple of times is The Obstacle is the Way um, by Ryan Holiday. Uh, a great uh, look at stoic uh, thinking and evidence and examples of it. Um, and then the quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Um, and that to me, remember what Jung said about fear. If you wanna know where someone is going to develop next, it's gonna be what they fear. So what are those opposing forces? And um, if we accept that these are the cognitive modes, which are the ones that you need to move into? I believe that introverted sensing types don't like risk, don't like disruptive, you know, volatility, things that, yep, guess what? If you wanna work on that, you need to move into that uh, kind of thing. Um, what I don't like, complexity, boundaries, procedures. I want to have freedom. I want to, you know, uh, I need to move into the, to those. Um, and, and here are more examples of what they are not. 
you see the and and the key is you can work on stuff that you're good at great but if you're really going to get good at it you've got to move into what what presents for you the biggest challenge um and and so again based on the work of danielle uh who kind of got me started in this but more um, these are the kinds of issues that I tend to find um, uh, they need to work on. Uh, and, and so that's my plea to you to kind of think about what is it that I need to, to work on most. Um, here's a couple of my inferences from all of this. Uh, one, there is a process of development and you're in it. And so the subjective nature of it makes it very hard to recognize kind of where am I in this. Um, we develop, or as Jung said, we happen ourselves to ourselves at different speeds and to varying degrees over our lifetime. What I find in the data too is that leaders who experience significant challenges tend to show more development. Um, I think ambition, you know, all of these eight different personality types, the common denominator was ambition. Uh, it was will, and that was propelling them, I think, to greater type development. I also find, and I don't have any proof for this, so I say maybe correlated. Um, Jung talks a lot about how people, non-geniuses can develop, uh, but geniuses he's seen develop or not develop. So I know that it's not a, a, a requirement or a given, but that I think can be part of it. The other thing that's not in here is a relationship to your mother. Um, in, in many of the cases of these top presidents, um, there was a strong attachment to the mother or loss of the mother or trying to be, you know, prove themselves as the hero uh, to their mother. And, and of course that goes beyond type. So any comments, questions? I almost finished on time, Sarah. I tried, but... Um, yeah. I have a quick question. Um, sure. I'll use Roosevelt as an example. <clears throat> mm -hmm. He comes out, take charge in the model, but yeah. um, how does the, uh, the circumstances within the world or your country mm -hmm. uh, make a difference when you look at take charge? For example, he went through the Great Depression and World War II. Had he mm -hmm. not gone through those, mm -hmm. um, would he have been a take charge kind of personality? Would that have been his dominant? Whereas when you see Obama, integrity, uh -huh. honesty, ethics, uh -huh. uh, I see those right. as good, tremendous leadership qualities. I'm mm -hmm. sure Roosevelt was a great leader too, but would he have been take charge if he hadn't gone through the depression, World War II, if circumstances yeah. hadn't pulled those out of him? Absolutely, Marianne. And so I, I, I want to answer, but first, when you started talking and said Roosevelt, I thought you were talking about Theodore Roosevelt. Oh, no, sorry. As a dominant leader type, take charge. And yeah. his was from early age. Uh, he had asthma and he said, I must take charge of my body. Okay. I will make my body do it. And, okay. and so his and, and, and so that's much more prevalent in his cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, what you're mm -hmm. saying is in, in the things that I think shaped uh, uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, yeah. were the, the big one that shaped him was getting polio. And, and this happened, of course, before he became president. And guess what? The thing that would come out in his uh, unconscious with that polio, guess what? He was coming into more extroverted sensing. Um, okay. and, and so dealing with his environment in an agile way was over for him. Uh, he couldn't do what he used to be able to do. So that was, to me, one of the, the key things that happened to him that produced this. And, but I think what you're on to, Marianne, is that it, it's a combination. Uh, it's yeah. the greatness comes out because the situation demands it or it pulls it, it out of you. Um, yeah. you know. And, and I would say that I'm not sure George Washington would be a great leader today because of the uh, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity, not because of his intellect, but his type, you know, is not 
adept at that dealing with that. So yeah. Marky has made a, a comment in the chat, Cash, uh -huh. and I know you can't say, and she says the times shape us and we yes. rise or fall in the context of those circumstances. Definitely. I totally agree, Marky. And, um, you know, it's interesting, Theodore Roosevelt uh, believed he would never be remembered as a great president because he never had a war. And if you look at the top 10 presidents, the top nine, most of them, almost all of them, uh, were either wartime presidents, and he's the only exception or one of the few exceptions. Um, so, yeah, situations okay. bring it out. Other questions, comments? Um, I, uh, Cash, I, I think it's really fascinating that the, the, I like that you called them the consequential presidents. And I'm sure that some of the folks who aren't as familiar with the US you know, history are not, maybe not relate to some of these, but um, the consequential presidents, um, you know, really regardless of party, we historically, we look back on them mm -hmm. and, and, and cite them and quote them and reference them in this reverent way, which is interesting to think about that, that because they were, they were more fully developed human beings. Mm -hmm. And, um, and as a result, um, stepped into leadership in a, in a, in a fully developed, more fully developed way. Yeah. Um, somebody in the chat asked if Donald Trump ever developed, you know, in his <laughs> mind, he's the greatest president that ever lived. But because I believe my politics will show here, but I believe his development was so limited. Um, he will just show up as a, as a, you know, a wackadoo because he, he just, it was so one-sided and so limited in the way that he expressed. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly he had to have developed because just because he's been on the planet for many years. I mean, there's a certain amount of development that one goes through simply by being alive. Um, but, um, but people like him are really an interesting example to me of how calcitrant we can become also as we age, as opposed to the more, the, you know, the, the sort of full blossoming. Yes. To me, type is the, the metaphor for type for me is the full blossoming of the personality. Yes. And for some people, they just, they always say, stay the bud, you know, they never quite, they never quite open right. up. Yeah. Um, and it's not just Trump, but there's a lot of people, the more polarized we become, yeah. the more, the more likely we are to stay in that bud stage rather than the blossoming. Thank you, Marky. Uh, great. It's, it's I'm always, always amazed at the amount of, of, of data that you take in and absorb. I do not, I, I certainly don't, I would not have the patience for this. So I'm always impressed. Thank you. No, thank you. So uh, that perspective taking, having all eight leader types within you, and that's something I think leaders and boards of directors need to understand is what are we missing in terms of the cognitive modes or leader types to make the best decision? And you talk about the situation. Let me, I didn't talk about uh, Harry Truman probably, but I do in my book, I go into the decision on which city to drop the atomic bomb on the two cities. And what I believe is because he was missing uh, visionary and basically missing introverted intuition and introverted thinking, he's not seeing the future consequences of what he's doing. He's not understanding the implications and he couldn't be very critically thinking. His statement around that was, I was in accord with the decision. I was in agreement. That extroverted feeling was saying was overriding him rather than because the decision to bomb had already been made when he was became president, but it was the city of which they decided to bomb that was, you know, needed some critical thinking. Uh, is this a precedent, you know, for the future that we want to set? Do you see what I mean in terms of missing that, that visionary and independent minded kind of um, ideal? Yeah. Other comments, questions? Uh, I, here's my email if you want to uh, reach out to me and uh, yeah. I have, a, I have a question or sort of a clarification about um, Spoto's model, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, because I, 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 adore, I adore Angelo Spoto. And um, it's also, first of all, 
I, I, I use and, and have become very familiar with BB's model, which is very mm-hmm. different. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is that almost no introverted feeling type that I know likes BB's model. Mm-hmm. Um, is there that. something about yeah. BB's model that just like mm-hmm. makes introverted feeling types very nervous or unco- I don't know what it is, but they just don't really care for it. Wow. Um, okay. And so that's, that's, that's just one piece that I'm always fascinated by, but um, I thought I've often thought about um, the type uh, functions. You know, we we talk about the theoretical extroverted function, function introverted. You know, we do that, but mm-hmm. really, um, I think of them as paired in this interesting way that Spoto has. Is that for me, extroverted feeling being dominant, and the underbelly of extroverted <laughs> feeling is always introverted thinking. Like mm-hmm. extroverted feeling can't really exist without that underbelly. Mm-hmm. Yes. And same with introverted thinking. It can't mm-hmm. really exist without that, that underbelly of extroverted feeling. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I think that's why sometimes when we talk about these functions, we have to always remember that when, we, when we're speaking about functions, it's always a theoretical idea. Like it's just theory. Yeah. They don't exist in isolation. Yeah. And, um, and it, which, which gives me, a, has me be more curious about Spoto's model in that, in, because I see some of that, that underbelly dynamic more clearly expressed here than I do in the BB model. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I will, I will reconsider. I, I love Angelo's work and I have just could listen to him for three days yeah. at a time if I could, if I could. Yeah. Well, and let me just say, Marky, thank you. Uh, for the interest in Angelo. I'm trying to obviously to generate more interest in, but I would be, I would need to say very quickly, I don't think the models are in opposition to each other. Um, and in fact, you know, BB's model is archetypal and bringing archetypal energies into my understanding of it. And, and admittedly, yes. I have a very limited understanding of BB's model. I, I know the order, I know that, you know, that kind of thing, but uh, Angelo's model is more, uh, descriptive and and sequential chronological uh it, yes. there, a process that you're going through now of course all those archetypes young I, I have so many quotes in my head about young the archetypes he said the archetypes are everywhere you're you're eating up and one of his big concerns about leaders were that they get possessed he goes into great detail talking about possession uh, you're possessed by this archetype of, you know i am the hero I can fix anything. I, you know, I'm, you know, all powerful or, or your persona, you get attached to that persona uh, of yourself rather than in, and so we've got to get back to ego development, you know, and, and work on that and stay out of all these archetypes and images of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Um, Yeah, hi, this is Doris. Um, I, first of all, hi, hi Cash. <laughs> so nice. Okay, uh, great presentation. Love Thank all you. the colors and the visuals, amazing. So Thank can you help me clarify a little bit because I'm also a new fan of uh, Mina Barimani's and mm-hmm. um, I understand yes. that her tricycle model is based on empirical evidence of, act- of looking at the eight functions per se. Mm-hmm. But the the weighting and the pairing and the balancing that we know from Myers Briggs and from the BB model is different because we're talking about function in the same attitudes. So can yeah. you help me square that away in terms of development a little bit? Well, and and I will have to say I I know the limits of my knowledge and my lack of knowledge, and I would say I'm probably not the best one to 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 answer that. What I understand is she um, uh, in her presentation yesterday she was presenting some of the latest correlations from a data set of 375,000 people who completed Dario Nardi's uh, assessment. Uh, online from 2007 up until the present. And and she's been able to dig, dig, dig into that data. And what she found, um, and and I have a presentation that that she and Mark Majors and Ray Moody did from 2017 APTI uh, that really goes into a great explanation of their findings 
that there is a predictable order, uh, that it varies by type. And, and what I'm suggesting in this presentation is a theory behind that order, uh, that, that the order they find is very close to the order that I see in these presidents in terms of their, uh, the development of those cognitive modes. So I can't, I, you know, I wish I could answer your question better, uh, Doris, um, uh, but there is, a, I, and I think again, age is huge. Um, I tell people that I took the indicator, um, part of I, this quick story, part of the, my midlife crisis, I went to a therapist and uh, he asked me how old I was. And I said, 38. And he said, you know, Jung said life starts at 38. And I go, who's young? <laughs> and I mean, I didn't. And that set me on a journey to kind of discovering what's going on with me and what's going on around me. But the age at which I took the type, get this, the, the indicator, I indicated ENFP and N was not just slight, it was moderate to clear. And my point is that's what was coming up in my unconscious at that time. I think there were some other reasons I indicated ENFP, but now it's very clear to me that, and, and so I think we have to pay attention to this order and where people are in terms of their age and development. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that I answered your question, Doris, but it was great to see you. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sarah? Yeah, could, could I just say, Cash, I'm going to need to end the meeting now um, because there's the BAPT AGM, which starts at seven, and I need to get in the room and get ready for that. Um, so just let me start.